So it is it is a privilege to chat with you. Honestly, I thank you so much uh, for the time. Uh, the Intangible Adorations Caravan is a really exciting project. I, I don't know much about it, but just what I've been able to read. Can you tell us a little bit about the caravan, how it started? Sure. And actually, I think what makes the most sense to start with is I create universes in my body of work since 2000. And I feel like I started that work in 2011. So now for a while, I've been creating universes. So one of them is the Uber Marionette universe. You probably saw the images of the that white. Uh, yeah. So one is the Uber Marionette universe. And within there is the intangible adoration story. So I premiered it in 2018. And I like how Bowie created Stardust. I presented myself as an art icon. And I added in with my Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which you might have read about, uh, I have an invisible but really severe disability. So for months I'll be bedridden and I can't yeah, communicate. So the first time it happened after I was producing films, folks thought that I was disappeared or I maybe had died or that I was in an institution because I was so bedlocked, I couldn't respond. So the icon in this intangible adorations universe always goes missing off the space time continuum. So that was my way to kind of reclaim my story as opposed to me being sick as a dog. I'm off the space time. Well, not I, the Uber marionette, but I use all these different personas to kind of tell stories in different ways. So yeah, the Uber marionette. And then I had a second body of work. That's Mama Dada, another persona, uh, was making time space portals. So here's the Uber marionette traveling back down to earth to perform and then up to actually really literally lie in that bed. Um, and then the Mama Dada space portals, they're wind and um, uh, light based portals. So there's air conditioning in them, there's fans. And, uh, and then I love giving audience an unexpected experience. So working those portals, I worked them, I think th three or four years in all different art galleries, anybody that would have me and the audience walked into them. So you were surrounded by this wonderful soundtrack by Marshall Dragoon, the triangle soundtrack. So you'd listen to this cool music and you would literally be in it. And I loved adding different temperatures. So it was cold. Um, so those two projects have come together for Intangible Adorations Caravan and a theater company named Other Hearts is um, pulling this caravan that's telling the story of me and they're trying to pull me down from the space time continuum. So the story this summer is, um, yeah, it's a disability led project. Other Hearts Collective is, a, is associated with uh, Tangled Art and Disability and then also Aaron Ball is the aerialist because there's a circus theme um, and this show has silks with all three main performers on them like it's really just this incredible um live show that's put together and it's one part and a very exciting part that we've been working on a while of this very large universe that i've been working on yeah like for a very long time so um so yeah i think that's what and i know it can be really hard to understand when i say that because it doesn't mean anything to folks um but yeah, this, I don't know anyone else that works in universes and all my universes also all meet up. So there's another artist that wanted to do a project and do a family photo of all my personas all in like one big old timey family photo. So yeah, so that's really um, gives more of a sense of what intangible adorations is. Uh, and then the sh that place is like what the show this this summer is. And it's actually by Other Hearts Collective. Uh, it's not my work per se, but it's based on my work. So it's it's really kind of cool, um, yeah, to have that being presented in parks and in these really cool spaces all summer. Um, so so yeah, and, um, and I guess to give a bit more context on the universes with the illness that I said I have, where I often am out of commission for a long time, I look really vibrant, but I actually have cognitive dropouts and I've just learned to like, actually people don't tell, people can't tell. I've learned how to channel myself, especially when I was producing films. Like I had, I was like responsible for all this stuff. So I got really good at pretending that I was okay. Um, so the universes were actually for me, it's when I was bedridden for months at a time. I, I work constantly. So when I couldn't work, then I would literally dream up these alternate universes, usually not based on earth, because I didn't feel like I was on earth. Um, so, um, 
so yeah, that gives a bit more context. So they're truly for me. My art is all, it saves my life. Like I've actually written a blog post that's art saves my life every day. Art saves my life, especially being as sick as I am. If I couldn't make things, I would, yeah, like I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so it saves my life every day. And then it's for me. And then I realize I love bringing audience members into my universes and the world has opened up to Intangible Adoration's caravan. I got money from the National Arts Center, the National Creation Fund, a large investment, Partners in Art, which is a private investment company I've wanted to work with for a while, Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Toronto. So to have all of that support, and then we have amazing uh, partners also, all the local art service organizations, Workman Arts, Tangled. Like it was really cool how, yeah, everyone's like this. And then also it's disability led. We have robust access into everything. So I really am into creative access. So our ASL um, is done by Deaf Spectrum and Sage is uh, filmed in a circus environment, like part of the same style and in costume. And it's actually there. So they're part of the caravan, not like an add on service. It's like part of who we are. And also audio description for blind and low vision folks. Also a character, also part of every show. So you know how most shows will have like, oh, this one has ASL and, and but it's like, that's, that is who we are. Um, and yeah, and I really am excited to come up with more creative access features to have a menu of access features uh, in my back pocket and creative. So yeah, not like, not just service people doing it, but how to put it right into the fabric of the work. Yeah, the, it's amazing. Honestly, like uh, watching, watching some of the videos online and seeing, I've, I've truly never seen anything like this. And I love... I, you you've already sort of asked or mentioned that, but I love how you're able to connect with and you know the neurodiverse, the disabled, because it is such an immersive experience, and it's not just you know someone on the side doing ASL or something. You you want to bring people it's, in exactly. And another thing that's been exciting um, is my performance art salon, who has been with Intangible Adoration since the beginning. They are the real stars of this show. It's it's created with them in mind. And that's another place where access came in because uh, actually a great example, I was gonna line the inside of the portal with mirrors. Mm -hmm. And then one of the salon members said that would be disorienting for them. So we're like, absolutely, we take it out. So that's how it's like, it's built, like a lot of stuff got built in because of just by nature of what we needed. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then the other thing, I remember some folks like, uh, because now I've gotten large investments from folks, some people, some people that didn't understand my work were like, oh, now you can hire real performers. And I was like, what? No, these are the, like, so my performance art salon, the work I do with them, uh, and the reason I call it salon, it, that's like, it's like a meeting of artists being, I'm not teaching them anything, we are just being in costumes and props and we play and it is glorious. And, um, they're my favorite performers when they are being themselves and they feel safe and they have their cool costumes on. I don't want anybody else. So th these are truly my people and the people that I want. It's not that I just use them because they were my students. This is what I've been doing. So I really always want to be clear. The salon will be performing with me forever. No, even if I have $5 million, I will just pay them. Well, that's, that's what this is. You know, one of the things that uh, just, just reading the, Press kitten. One of the phrases I thought really caught my attention is "madness is a source of communal activation," and and it sounds like really? this is what you're talking about. But could you expand on that a little more? That concept actually came from Sean Lee, the curator from Tangled, who at the beginning was helping me, um, yeah, navigate the right language around the the disability um, the wording when we were doing the grants originally. And, um, and I realized, and this, I'm actually, so I'm just saying stuff off the top of my head. It might be a little all over the place. I haven't thought about this specifically before. Um, oh, hang on. Can you ask the question again? I got sidetracked in my head. Uh, I was just going to say, if you could, uh, you know, expand a little bit more on the idea of madness as a source of communal activation. I suppose I was really keen, like how I'm writing my own story. Like, I'm like, I'm missing. I'm not sick. Um, I feel like madness some folks think it's like 
and actually Sean, this was back to the curator. Sean had once said that people think that art is good for disability. Like it's a great thing for disabled folks to do. And Sean proposes and Tangled proposes that disability is good for art because my madness is 100%. Like when I have full cognitive dropouts, that's when these, in, these universes are just in my head and I'm living in them. So my madness 150% is and my illness if i wouldn't be bedridden if my mind wouldn't be like that um it wouldn't be so i guess i want to yeah i was trying to figure out the right way to to celebrate this amazing thing as opposed to it being like oh look there's people that look different and are different do you know what i mean um so i think that was the best wording i could come up with to figure out how to celebrate the difference and and say it's like rare and precious that's the whole point of the icon because the icon is weak like in the, even in this show this summer the icon can only be on earth for a while and then the icon can't breathe and has to go back in uh, and the icon this year is being played by sylvae mercedes uh from other hearts um but we built that sensitivity in and as opposed to a problem i want to and I'm, I'm doing that in my own life i'm trying to be less ableist with myself and be like hey i'm i'm precious because truly I have about an hour or two of work in me a day. I've been pushing like mad through this project and I, my body, I was like out again. I, but with the, so instead I'm like, I'm precious. I'm like a precious commodity and I'm a consultant on stuff now, as opposed to like, oh my God, I wish I could work more. So, like, so even for myself, I was just trying to figure out differently. So I think those words are the, the best way to put that into art speak, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a fa it's a wonderful concept actually, and just even even you talk about how art saves your life, I think yeah. it's amazing to me. Like that's an amazing idea. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? I mean, you've told me about these universes. You create universes and and you live in them, which is awesome. I isn't it? I'll create universes is like the best sentence I've heard <laughs> ever. Um, but but how does art save a life? The first, so I've always had this illness, but I didn't, nobody, I didn't get my diagnosis till 218. I was in my forties. Wow. So basically like gym teachers would force me to do stuff till I'll faint. And I would get depressed even as a child for things, because again, my body would actually shut down. Like with it, with EDS, my body, that's why I'm actually wearing this brace. My body is not strong. It's not a brace, uh, support. I think they call it a joint support system. Mm -hmm. Um, my body's not quite strong enough to support itself. You can actually see in my hands, like see this? I'm literally like, a, someone said, I'm like a cat, not a dog. You know that like mushy feeling. So I'm like so exhausted all the time. And then when I didn't know I had an illness, people just said, oh, Lisa's mental. And then I, sometimes I can't walk. And Lisa's like, oh, Lisa's so mental, she can't walk. That was the only thing that the medical community came up with. The world was super ableist. Everyone just would force me, I'd be nauseous and like, falling over and fainting and everyone just laughed at me so it was really hard but I truly I didn't I was like I'm, I, I can't I don't know I, I, and even like a loving person in my life was like what kind of kids always tired and I was like I don't know a cool kid like I didn't know how to respond within what was sort of given to me and then in 2008 I was producing a, uh, with my film production company I was going to the Cannes Film Festival with my first film there and I had like a complete mental and physical breakdown at Cannes with a new sheltered assistant. <laughs> Which, it, was, it, was, it was like the worst. I had a bunch of gowns that had been lent to me by Canadian designers. And I was stuck sweating in pajamas. And then even like the place I'd rented, I couldn't use the phone. I couldn't figure anything out. My assistant, I said, please, like she was so freaked out. I said, please go home, like leave. Like I gave her permission to go because I couldn't do anything. And then I... It's funny, I don't remember, I literally don't remember coming home. My really close friend met me at the airport. She was British, I guess London. And then at some point I was home and my cognition dropped out for the largest part of the year. And that was the first time. So that was 2008. I guess that was actually the first universe work that, but that wasn't what I was doing. I was just, I felt like I was lying in cold, dark silence. So I wasn't tortured. I was more like numb. And thinking back on it later, I was like, it was almost like Zen training, but against my will. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was just this, mm. and I remember I was like, do I want to live? I was like, what's going on? And then I, um, I used the universes and the work, but actually the first work, now that I think back to that, those times, I was just using my laptop 
um, to do, and I would use self portraits because I was like, who am I? So I would use these self portraits to try to literally figure out who I was in this time. And again, I was mostly in the bed. So I'd like, there's one that looks really beautiful and ethereal, like I'm an angel. It's a dollar store bag on my head and really bright lighting in my face. So I literally would use garbage off the street or off my own floor when I was really sick and create like magic. And the first time I couldn't walk, I put a camera on the ceiling on a C stand and I realized lying on the floor, I could fly. So the darkest places, so I have this whole series of work with my hair fanned out and I look like I'm flying in all ways. So, and then, yeah, for all those years from, yeah, like for, I think in 211, the Phoenix Art Museum picked up my work off Facebook. I, I thought at that point I was just a failed filmmaker. Um, and then my professional career started again, but between 208 crashing at the Cannes Film Festival and 211, I used that kind of work based on stuff and find the most, I, I, I was, I called it making like from the mundane to the marvelous. Cause I had nothing. I literally had actual garbage. I mean, that's not, that's not true. I have costumes, I have stuff, but in 208, my place had literally been like wrecked. I had just had a relationship end. someone like ripped it all apart. I had rats. Like I literally was in the actual, from, from my lovely home, I was in a really bad place. So that stuff during that time, I remember holding on to like universes and starting to create stuff and making something marvelous, making these gorgeous photos. So once I started putting them back online, then my friends are like, oh, she's fine. Look, she must have a team. Look at her photos. So it was really interesting to see that. And even during my sickest years, I always made output constantly, mostly personal. Um, and then, and then I actually started having interns come in and, and then I've been working with interns and now crews again, even on my personal work. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's, that probably gives you more sense of how it saved my life. Because if I would not have had art at that time, I probably would have opted out. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's incredible. And I love life. I'm sure you can probably tell that was just because it, and you can't take the pain and the endless nothing, a human, a soul, like my soul was so broken. I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's amazing. That's incredible. Um, you know, we, one of the things that, that fascinates me about about uh, intangible adorations and about the caravan is that there's a, there's an intent of balance of highlighting disabilities as a difference that matters without focusing on disabilities. I think that was the, the phrase. How do you walk that balance? Well, this, so we're trying this. It's again, this is like literally for the first time with Taro and for myself. Um, because I, I just, we have found that the way that it's often worded about our work is like, oh, look at that. Like in this just strange way. So I wanted to like change that. Um, and actually Erin, our aerialist, who's a double amputee, shared with me um, that she's had really unfortunate wording of things in the media around that, that it wasn't her choice of wording. So I guess when something gets weird like that, I like to change the conversation. So that's why I was like, hey, we're just so friggin' cool. This is us. Oh, yeah. And we're disabled. So that's kind of what my my, my loose plan. And this is stuff I'm I want to figure out with Taro moving forward. I want to figure out um, for myself. And then with the disability community. Because this time, too, I, I had done a few blog posts and folks didn't like the wording I had used. So I was like, okay, you ha I want to check every wording with every person like it is an in an intense amount of labor um but that is part of the labor of this and also the access features on the art as you can imagine like this show this summer is actually a hundred fifty thousand dollar budget and a hundred and fifty thousand dollar access budget like for accessibility but it's creative access so it's like put together but this stuff is all incredibly expensive and incredibly time consuming working with a disabled team and then also creating for a disabled audience it doubled the price of the show. Wow, that's incredible and actually exciting in a in a strange way because, I mean, you 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 are still able to invest in both things equally is is remarkable. Like you hear people tell stories of, oh yes, well we've done this great thing, but we're struggling to find the financing to be more accessible to do yeah. these. Things. But you actually have the same budget for both things is is wonderful. Yeah, well, I think that I guess the like. I've been a producing whiz since I was a kid. When I was in high school, I reached out to 20th Century Fox Canada 
And a group that I was associated with did this enormous fundraiser for people with AIDS in 20th Century Fox. And then we were invited to perform at the Sky Dome when they had these like, these had these food drives at the Sky Dome. So I was 17 years old. They screwed me over. They gave me five grand and then they canceled the show because the Jays won the World Series and the Jays have the rights over the thing. They just wanted my 5,000 back, but I bought like 30 wigs for my show and they still wanted it back. So I learned as a 17 year old kid how much contracts matter. And I worked all summer at a law firm to pay back what, um, I don't remember, it was the 20th Century Fox publicity department or something like that. So I was like, whoa, but that was me as a little kid. When I was in grade two, I put on a full scale production of Annie. I went into my principal's office with a with a thing. Like I was so adulty. I'd made a thing in Woodshop and I gifted it to him, which is weirdly uh, adulty and like, I don't know. And then I said, I wanna put on a, a little orphan Annie play um, and, and he said, yes, I don't think he was probably surprised. And I didn't ask him. I think I told him I was raised by folks that don't, don't ask questions. So I realized that I just would say stuff. And I think that's, and also I didn't have any friends. I spoke German. No one really wanted to be my friend. I had one friend when I put on a play, everybody wanted to be in my play. And actually when I reposted it, I reposted a picture because part of the, there's a film portion that is a, a biography of me, like how I fit into here. Oh, actually, I can show you a look if I stop my video. That's me as Little Orphan Annie. Oh. I made the wig myself. I made the, the that, that's actually a red t-shirt inside out and a blouse underneath uh, and a pantyhose bum and wool. I made the costumes for the entire show. And my friend who, when I posted this picture said, oh my God, remember we did it in French? And I was like, no, I think you misremembered. And they're like, yeah, we had to do it in French because it was in French. I went to French school and we had to. So we created a French Annie with English songs. That was my thing. And that friend didn't know. They're like, no, it was a class play. And I was like, no, it was my play. And she's like, no, it was the school that did it. And I was like, yeah, no, I did it. So that was me. So that's how I was able to raise $300,000 for this. And I'm a master pitch pitch maker so that it was actually my video that raised all the money not like it's funny because someone said oh you, there's no way you can raise you know real money without a script or without a product and i was like i raised pretty much three hundred thousand dollars no i raised three hundred thousand dollars with my pitch video and me wow, wow. incredible that's amazing so I am a unicorn in the disability community, being as sick as I am, and then having this particular work ethic around producing stuff that also, that saved my life. Like, I, like before Annie, nobody, like I said, like, and, but really nobody had any interest in me whatsoever. And they still didn't really like me. Like in grade eight, they put on Annie and they put a guy in the role of Annie. And I think it was a diss on me. Like they didn't ask me to be in it. So, but I was like, wow, someone already did a kind of like a parody of me. I didn't take it as an insult. I took it as a compliment, even though I think it was meant as an insult. Um, so yeah, that's me. Wow. That's amazing. Lisa, it, it's incredible. I mean, we're, I'm speechless. <laughs> this is just, it's just amazing. I'm, I'm amazed at, at, at you and this incredible, incredible project oh. you're working on. I will share this one thing. I tried at the beginning, but it was a bit too long. Um, oops, that's not what I'm trying to do. Hang on. <laughs> um, it was a bit too much on my face. I didn't want to distract. But this is how, like, so I like to bring magic all the time. So on Zoom calls, I like to just put a little bit of my, like, portal work. And this is another way that I bring it in um, to real life, but I didn't want it jittering in your face. Different daylights make different effects with it. Um, but this is one of my video pieces. So yeah, this is what the portals, well, you, you probably, you saw some of the video stuff, like the portals all have my original work in them. And I've worked with a few musicians. Um, and I really like to bring magic and I can, yeah, I can make magic with anything, the mundane into the marvelous. And my realistic confabulation is I use my real life, excuse me. And then I make it even wilder because I've had an incredible life already in terms of the work I've done. Um, there's one point in the film that no one believes, but the very first article written about me, I won, I won an acting award in New York and the Toronto Sun, um, Natasha Stoinoff at the time did an interview of me cause I'd won best actress at the New York fringe. So she was like the New York correspondent for the Sunday sun for, I guess that's entertainment. Um, and yeah, I really connected, um, with her. And I was always wearing pajamas at the time. That's just what I wore. And it's part of my EDS thing. My body's in so much pain that clothes hurt. So I went to the interview in pajamas and the actual article said, Lisa Wagner, a Canadian Hugh Hefner, 
because of my pajamas, right? But because that was the first mainstream media thing put out about me, it's like out there. And then by some weird fluke, and this, and I've nothing to do with Hugh Hefner whatsoever right, right. besides the pajamas. And then by some weird fluke, if you look at my IMDb, which is the International Movie Database, yeah. right at the bottom, and it's not me. There's a Lisa Wagner, not Anita, but the same two names in a Playboy Jamaica Runaway Bay thing, which is not porn. It's just some weird other video, but it got attached to my IMDb. And I kept, I was like, this is not me. Please take it off. This is not me. Please take it off. And I think because it said that like I was attached anyway, that is just like the weirdest thing. But so I've had really strange things like that. So we put it in the film that I was known as the Canadian Hugh Hefner and zoom into the article and everyone's like, oh, you made that up. So I want to have things that if people look it up, it's real. And then and then the the other stuff, the space time stuff, I add to it. And that way, nobody can tell me anything about myself because they don't even know the language. <laughs> and also, f folks are always re really worried about taking work and stuff. And I was like, take my concept. Nobody can make my work. So I'm really like, I have a different uh, take on that too. No, I, well, absolutely. And like I said, uh, the visuals and that, I, I, earlier you referred to it uh, almost like Starman, there is a Bowie esque feel to the atmosphere. It's uh, it's incredible. When I was really sick and I would meditate, a three quarter size Ziggy Stardust would come and hang out with me, and I didn't know what to do. And I looked in a mirror in my in my mind, and I saw myself as Ziggy Stardust, and that's why I did it. Wow, wow. Well, I mean, man, this is amazing, uh, Lisa. Uh, but we're running out of time. We're running out of time, but. How can people find out where the caravan lands next? How can how can people uh, connect? With uh, you? Intangible adorations. Actually, you know what? Um, we're yeah, we're going to update the website. We're actually we had a hard time with the permits because the uh, park uh, parking lots were all so sold to Green Pea, and after um, COVID, everyone and their uncle's uncle is trying to find permits. So one of the reasons we don't have we just had two shows. So September. And actually, Taro can can confirm this for me. September, there's a date in Stan Wadlow Park. And then right now, we're looking at a few different locations for July and August. And we will let folks know on intangibleadorations.com. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I'll make and sure my production them. company is mightybraveproductions.com. They are the same website, but just, um, yeah, just so folks know who I am. And that was from a dream, too. Um, I dreamed I was Joan of Arc as a little kid. So the, the logo for Mighty Brave Productions is Joan of Arc. Um, and I had a voice in my head as my, Alexa, I'll show you, it's right here. I had a voice in my head as a little kid and Joan of Arc was the first, um, story I ever heard of another kid that had a voice. And so this is, oh, now I'll turn it off. Hang on a second. <laughs> the now, effect, can, I can't, yeah, I can't. now the effect is, is, does not make any sense anymore. None. Um, so this was sort of what I dreamed too, Mighty Brave Productions, uh, powered by Joan of Arc. Wow. Wow. I love it. Great. Well, Lisa, thank you. Uh, pleasure. Thank you it's a time. pleasure. This is, this has been a joy and I really appreciate it. And I will make sure that we get the word out on, uh, on the, on the caravan and what's coming next. Thank you so That's much. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great day. All right. <laughs>